Welcome, bienvenidos. For those who want to continue in English, stay put. Las personas que desean escuchar la versión en español, por favor, elegir el idioma oprimiendo el botón en forma de círculo donde dice español en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Gracias. Again, welcome and good morning to all of our live attendees today. We are so thrilled you're here to engage in this exciting webinar titled Liberation Psychology, Trauma-Informed Integrated Behavioral Health with Dr. Tama Bryant. I'm Tiffany O'Shaughnessy. I'm one of the hosts of our webinar today. First things first, a brief audio description of myself. I am a white cisgender woman, she, her pronouns, with reddish brown hair, chin length hair. I'm wearing a black top and my background is a mountain tapestry. I'd like to acknowledge that SF State's campuses in San Francisco sit on the ancestral homeland of the Roma Tishaloni. We further acknowledge that we work on the ancestral lands and waters of many other indigenous peoples and nations in our field work in the Bay Area and around the world. We're committed to ensuring this webinar is accessible to our audiences. Closed captioning is available in the closed captioning option at the bottom of your screen. If at any time your access needs are not met or become not met during the webinar, please send a chat directly to a host or co-host. Access is always a work in process, so we appreciate your comments, feedback, and support. We will also do our best to speak slowly today to support our interpreters' work. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Counseling, Marriage and Family Counseling Program here at SF State and a co-investigator of this project. I'm working alongside the primary investigator, Dr. Julie Cronister, and our co-investigator, Dr. Molly Struhl, who are also faculty in the counseling program. I would also like to thank our graduate assistant, Chinui Igwe, who's working hard to stay on top of the technical issues, chat boxes, et cetera, today. This is the final installment of our 10 webinar series sponsored by our Equity and Justice Focus Integrated Behavioral Health Project, which is fully funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration as part of an award totaling $1.9 million. A couple of additional things before we begin. If you are one of our HRSA stipend recipients, or you are a California-based LPCC, LMFT, or LCSW interested in receiving continuing education units for your attendance today, please pay close attention to the announcements provided in the chat for sign-in and evaluation links. It's also a reminder that this is a live recorded Zoom webinar. Therefore, the audience is not visible and the audience cannot turn on their video or audio. There will be some time for questions at the end, you can post your questions for our speaker throughout the talk by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. The chat function is also available for comments, reactions, and sharing of resources, and will be moderated by our hosts. If we can't get to all the questions, please contact the presenter directly. And so now, it is with great pleasure that I introduce today's presenter. Dr. Tama Bryant, she, her, is the president-elect of the American Psychological Association, the leading scientific and professional organization representing psychology with more than 120,000 members. Dr. Tama Bryant completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Duke University and her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical Center's Victims of Violence Program. Upon graduating, she became the coordinator of the Princeton University SHARE program, which provides intervention and prevention programming to combat sexual assault, sexual harassment, and harassment based on sexual orientation. She is currently a tenured professor of psychology in the Graduate School of Education and Psychology at Pepperdine University, where she directs the Culture and Trauma Research Laboratory. Her clinical and research interests center on interpersonal trauma and the societal trauma of oppression. She is a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women and a past APA representative to the United Nations. Currently, she serves as the elected vice president and racial equity officer for her neighborhood council in Los Angeles. Dr. Tama also served on the APA Committee on International Relations and Psychology and the Committee on Women in Psychology. We are so honored to have her sharing her wisdom with us today, and I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Tama. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be with you all, and I have to uh, acknowledge the role of your lead in uh, helping me to win the election for APA. Uh, a vital member of our um, campaign group, which really uh, became a family, and I am so grateful, uh, the dream team. So thank you all so much for being here as we center in today on liberation psychology, trauma-informed integrated behavioral health. 
And before we even begin, I need to name that I am not only looking at those that we serve and their liberation, but our liberation as well for all of us who have various marginalized identities and also all of us who are trauma survivors of various forms, including surviving this pandemic. And so I hope as you will reflect that you will center in not only on those that you serve, but also your own liberation. And my screen is not moving, but I'm used to teaching online, so I will stop share and reshare. All right, there we have it. So my pronouns, as you heard, are she, her, and hers. I am a Black woman, a woman of African descent. Along with being a psychologist, I'm a minister, a sacred artist, a mother, a daughter, a sister, a partner, a friend, an activist, a scholar, a learner, who is actively resisting colonial notions that we have to choose one lane. It is important for us to intentionally be everything that we are in all times and in all places. And so I remind our students at Pepperdine University, if you get to the point of graduation and you have left yourself behind, it wasn't worth it. And so I invite you to think about how you can be more authentically your full self, even in these quote unquote professional spaces. I want to give a land recognition that I live and work in a land that has been cultivated by the Tongva peoples and other indigenous peoples. We recognize their history, culture, contribution, and violations past and present. I also want to give a labor recognition. The United States had accelerated growth and the reason we were able to grow so rapidly was based on exploited labor, largely of people of African descent. And so that is not just black history, but that is US history. And we want to be mindful and allow our land and labor recognition to guide our work, to guide our engagement, to guide our relationships and our awareness of ourselves. I want to name that we are meeting during a socio-political climate of hostility, instability and overt violence as we acknowledge uh, the victims and their families in Buffalo and across the US. And also as we are aware of being global citizens, those who are suffering and struggling for liberation across the globe. I want to name that even though we like to move forward as if it's business as usual, that each of us have been affected by the global pandemic. We have faced visible and invisible losses and so for us to be mindful, to be compassionate toward ourselves and toward others. I want to name as I think about oppression and other forms, diverse forms of marginalization, that oppression is not just something that happens out there. Many institutions would like me to come in and talk with employees and students about the ways they can cope with the oppression that is happening in the larger society but we often get uncomfortable talking about the ways in which oppression shows up in our field, shows up in our training, shows up in our practice, shows up in our supervision. And so I invite you to lean into that reality that it is not just an issue out in the larger world, uh, but one that we are intimately connected with in our professional and personal lives. I want to name for you that I resist and reject the myth of neutrality. My interest in addressing oppression is not simply because it is intellectually interesting. It is not something I'm just curious about. Uh, it is an issue for which I feel the urgency uh, for myself, for my communities and for other marginalized communities. And I want uh, you to know as opposed to how we have often been taught that you're feeling the urgency and the commitment uh, to addressing these issues is not a barrier, but it is what allows the work to be sustainable for it not to be uh, a fad where we have a bumper sticker or a post up one day 
and then we have forgotten about it by the next season, uh, but it is an ongoing commitment. So our learning objectives are to identify principles and key assumptions of a trauma-informed approach, to describe racial trauma related to various forms of violence and the impact of that trauma on mental health, to describe the role of advocacy and intervention in culturally responsive counseling. So I am a lover of words. I love poetry and spoken word. Uh, Lucille Clifton, who was an African-American poet, wrote these words, come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill us and has failed. And the Mexican proverb, which reads, they tried to bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. They tried it. <laughs> they try daily to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. And so with both quotes, I want to encourage you to hold the realities of the trauma and the terror, and at the same time, to hold the realities of the survivorship, of the flourishing, of the thriving, of the resilience, that they coexist and one does not eliminate the other. So as we think about being trauma-informed, it's important that we understand racism and other forms of trauma as complex as opposed to acute. That while we might highlight in the news these single incidents, uh, it is an ongoing reality, uh, which some have called uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Others have connected to intergenerational trauma, to historical trauma, and some use the frame ancestral wounds. And so complex trauma, long-term trauma, can disrupt our sense of ourselves, can make it difficult for us to regulate our emotions, can also make it difficult to trust and to build and maintain relationships. This, of course, is looking at those who have been targeted. And we want to also be aware of the psychological dynamics of those who are both active uh, perpetrators and uh, offenders and carriers of marginalizing oppressive actions, as well as those who are silent beneficiaries. So when we are the targets of uh, trauma, whether the trauma of oppression, uh, medical pandemic, or interpersonal trauma, such as sexual assault and child abuse, we are aware of the release of hormones that can show up in four major response tendencies, um, fight, flight, freeze, tend and befriend. I want to briefly speak about those four as it relates to marginalized persons dealing with the realities of the terror of oppression. That some people's response is to be in fight mode and uh, often that can show up with a hypervigilance, a difficulty trusting, uh, and the benefit is these are persons who will catch it quickly. So if there is a microaggression, if something is being done or said that is unjust, uh, they are quickly ready to mobilize and to respond. Uh, and so that is the benefit of fight mode. As you can imagine, a cost of fight mode is it can be draining, it can leave you in a place of despair and hopelessness. It can also cause you to fight people who perhaps could have been uh, supporters or allies. And it also uh, leaves us very depleted. Uh, some people, uh, as opposed to quickly mobilizing in the face of oppression, uh, their tendency may be toward flight. And so when they see it showing up in the institution and the organization, uh, they rapidly exit. So the benefit of that is not staying too long in places where you are mistreated, undermined, devalued, disrespected. Uh, the challenge of that can be the reality that oppression exists um, across organizations and institutions. And so there can then be a perpetual sense of never being able to create home in a place. 
emotional, psychological home. Some of us in the face of oppression respond with the freeze, uh, the disconnection. Uh, we are startled and shocked. And th those are uh, the ones who, like me sometimes, will hours later say, now what I should have said, <laughs> right? That you may come up with uh, your solutions much uh, longer than the actual event. And then, uh, you know, the, the benefit of, of freeze and dissociation is it's our minds helping to take helping us to take care of ourselves to check out because it is so overwhelming uh, and the cost can be uh, feeling immobilized feeling powerless uh, feeling regret uh, for not having moved immediately in the way you would have liked and what I encourage people along these lines to know that if it's an ongoing environment like your workplace or school even if you missed it in the moment it is possible to revisit it, to bring it up at the next staff meeting, the next faculty meeting, the next class, to say that something was said that I want to address today. And then around marginalization, we also have those who uh, lean toward tend and befriend. And so uh, those are marginalized persons who determine who has power in a place and will seek to find favor with those in power um, often to the detriment of other marginalized people. So they want to be the special one, the chosen one, the safe one. They get rewarded for demeaning and putting down other members of their group. So it's important to reflect on uh, these as survival strategies and to think about for us individually and also for our clients, what has been uh, the benefit, what we have gained, and also what it has cost. So to be trauma-informed in our work, we want to be committed to being informed about the pervasiveness of trauma and to be sensitive to the impact of trauma. We want to provide a safe and stable and understanding environment, and we want to actively work against re-traumatizing those whom we serve. By acknowledging trauma and its triggers, and avoiding stigmatizing students or clients or colleagues. To be trauma-informed, some have argued, would be better framed as being healing-informed, that we don't just want to center the experiences that people have had, which have been overwhelming and disturbing, uh, but to really have a vantage point of the person. So what I like to say is trauma affects me, but it doesn't define me, define me. Oppression, marginalization, racism, sexism affect me, but they do not define me. And so there is more to us than what has been done to us. So we want to be mindful of the impact of oppression and marginalization, while also really getting to know our clients beyond their experiences of invalidation. So we think about healing and along the lines of healing, it's important for us to consider our work beyond symptom cessation. So often we frame our work around the goal of decreasing negative symptoms, but I hope you are aware someone may no longer have suicidal thoughts and still have no sense of joy. Someone may have uh, cut back on their cutting behaviors, their self-harming behaviors, uh, their addictive behaviors, and still not have a sense of who they are, a sense of identity, a sense of connection, a sense of purpose. And so, yes, I'm very much aware as we are doing our treatment planning that it is often largely focused on what we are seeking to eliminate or to decrease. Uh, but for us to also be mindful about what does healing look like? What does liberation look like? What are the factors that we would be seeking to enhance, to build, to increase? And I also want to have in your minds from liberation psychology, the notion of problematization. So problematization reminds us to be thoughtful about the fact that ultimately the client is not the problem. They are not a problem person and communities who are marginalized and experience oppression are not problem people. 
the problem is the trauma, right? The problem is the lack of justice. The problem uh, is oppression and violation. Those are the problems. And then what we are seeing in people uh, often is the symptom and the impact of stereotype, stigma, discrimination, violation. So we also want to be mindful of moving uh, beyond cultural awareness to active engagement and cultural humility. So many people have shifted away from this language of cultural competence uh, because largely people would uh, often take one class like this, uh, one webinar, or read one book or do one semester, and there was a sense of finality. I'm culturally competent, I read the book. I'm culturally competent, I took the class. And so we want to shift into a sense of fin from finality to cultural humility, an ongoing stance of openness and a commitment to lifelong learning, not just learning about the quote unquote other, but learning about ourselves and recognizing the ways in which the socio-political context shows up within us. We also want to know that often historically cultural competence was defined as awareness, knowledge, and skills. And we want to not just be aware of culture and cultural oppression, but to actively be engaged in working uh, toward anti-oppression, uh, including anti-racism. And so many times those who are in the field, if I were to say, uh, raise your hand if you're against oppression, over 90% of people, I hope, would say yes. But then if I followed that up with how does your opposition to oppression show up in your practice, many people would stumble. And I think it is not necessarily a lack of sincerity, but deficits in our training. And so we also need to train the trainers and reteach the supervisors uh, so that we can contextualize uh, the lives that people have. So some foundational constructs, it's important to know that racism and all forms of oppression are bigger than bias. So I know people are much more comfortable with this word bias um, because it's, you know, it's very diluted and it keeps it on the individual basis. And so then people can get dismissive and say, well, we all have biases and there's just nothing we can do about it, but just try to be more aware of our biases. And the reason it's important to know oppression is bigger than bias is if it's just a matter of some individuals don't like me, what we teach children in preschool is just stay away from the people who don't like you. So if I become aware that someone three doors down doesn't like black people, well, I'm just not gonna go to their house, right? So then it seems like problem solved. But the reality, it is bigger than uh, individual interaction, that oppression, uh, it, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, heterosexism, uh, transphobia, xenophobia, uh, they are systemic and they are protected and maintained by power and privilege. So we want to be aware it is not just a matter of individual liking and not liking or preferences, uh, but that it is unavoidable, that the realities of racism uh, show up in our educational system show up in our healthcare system, show up in the criminal injustice system. Uh, they show up when people are even trying to sell their homes where you can get a better price for, for your home if you are a person of color and you remove all the pictures. It shows up when we are applying for home loans and applying for jobs and even applying for apartments. And so this is uh, documented and we want to uh, be really mindful of its pervasiveness. We also want to be mindful of the impact, the passing down of the trauma uh, across generations. And so there are three different ways that we can think about trauma being passed down through the generations. There is the neurobiological piece uh, where trauma literally uh, changes the brain and uh, then that can get passed down. We look at some of the research studies with descendants of the Holocaust. Um, but the good thing about neuroplasticity is healing can also transform the brain and then we can pass down healing uh, to the next generation. 
not only do we see uh, the, the physical components uh, and the neurological components of trauma, uh, we also are aware of learning by observation. So for those who come from marginalized identities, how did you see the people who raised you change in certain circumstances? How did you see members of your community who were elders uh, in some cases have to shape shift uh, their voice, their facial expression, their posture? And then not only what did you observe, um, but also what were you taught directly? So many people were taught you have to be twice as good. You have to always be on. You can never let people see you weak or vulnerable. Uh, that literally since the Harlem Renaissance, we have had the poem, we wear the mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our teeth and shades our eyes. And so then when people come in well defended, uh, often they can be prematurely terminated or they are often categorized as resistant to care. And what I like to say that to that is, Perhaps we are not resistant to care. Perhaps the care was boring. Perhaps the care was not relevant uh, to our reality. Uh, perhaps the care didn't warrant taking two buses and finding a babysitter uh, only to be met with silent scribbling uh, in a notepad. So we want to uh, animate our practice uh, to really come alive and to be present uh, with those who have been carrying so much. Audre Lord, another uh, black feminist poet said, this woman is black, so her blood is shed in silence. And so we want to be aware of the silencing that has often taken place, uh, even in our intake forms. So those of us who have a specialty of trauma uh, have often felt successful by adding uh, to intake forms questions about child abuse or partner abuse. And that is very important and it traditionally was not there. We ask questions in the field about the things that we have decided are important. And so even when people don't come in with stress about work, we obtain a work history because we have decided as a field and as a society that working is important. We ask about what substances people use because we have decided that's important. Some of us ask people in the first couple of sessions when they are still basically strangers about molestation because we've decided that's important. But when I say that we should ask questions about people's experiences with discrimination, with stigma, with stereotype, there are people who have pushed back on that and said that's political. So I want you to take that in. Molestation, work, substance use, even asking people their criminal history uh, is not political, but asking if they have been mistreated based on their identity is political and therefore unacceptable. So we want to think about the ways in which our discipline has been silent on racial trauma. So historically, you know, the term trauma, people connected with veterans and war, post-traumatic stress disorder, people go to war and come back. And then through advocacy, we recognize uh, that survivors of family uh, violence and school violence um, are also uh, trauma survivors. And it is important to also recognize uh, the ways in which uh, oppression is a societal trauma. And we need to uh, acknowledge and examine honestly what has been the resistance in the field. So some people will say, well, if you call racism trauma, it's gonna dilute the term too much. So then everything is trauma, so nothing is trauma. So you wanna really listen to that argument that for me to acknowledge the terror of oppression would dilute the term and make it mean nothing. And I say that to you as someone who is both a survivor of oppression and a survivor of sexual assault. And yes, we have to look at the similarities and the differences uh, but the lack of acknowledgement, uh, the invalidation and the erasure and the minimizing are also a part of the problem. We want to be mindful that uh, racial trauma and other forms of oppression that we experience not only historically, but in a contemporary sense, 
and that we are not only primary targets, but vicarious traumatization. So for my uh, Asian American students who talked about uh, in the past couple years, the surge in anti-Asian uh, hate and violence, uh, that even if they were not individually targeted, talking about the experience and the impact of walking around with that vigilance and fear, not only for themselves, but for their community members. Uh, also, as we look at the realities in uh, Buffalo, that even, so you have the black community there who was terrorized, but you also have black people outside of Buffalo who are living uh, with that fear, with that terror, uh, with that anger and frustration. And so we want to be mindful of that and with that grief. So racism can affect our health in diverse ways. It can uh, result in a lack of resource to quality care. In this country, race and SES are inextricably linked. And so some people don't want to acknowledge racism and they wanna say, oh, the only issue is poverty. And I wanna to say to that, one, the two are linked. And two, even for people of color who gain wealth, they still deal with the realities of racial trauma. It also affects our health with lack of insurance, with stress activation in the body, with patient distrust of doctors. And I wanna say that the problem is not the distrust, but the experiences that they have had that have broken the trust. Often we create initiatives to improve patient trust uh, or client trust that never addresses uh, the reasons, the root causes. So for example, that next bullet, uh, the research shows that medical personnel are less likely to trust the reports of people of color about their own pain and about their symptoms. And so they are less likely to be given pain relief. And we saw during the pandemic, more likely to be sent home. And this dismissal of symptoms has also resulted in higher rates of maternal death. Uh, health behaviors are also diminished, uh, sometimes lack of access. So even for example, when we think about exercise, when people are living in communities uh, that are not safe, then it can be uh, more difficult to just get out and walk or to engage in that way. The realities of environmental racism I invite you in your cities to look up the, the maps of where uh, the greatest pollutants are and to notice that it is merged with, it's more likely to be in low income communities and in communities where it is predominantly people of color. And so uh, that affects even our very breath when we think about uh, the rates of asthma and also when we think about the pandemic and even the marching uh, kind of cry, I can't breathe and we can't breathe. Uh, we also are aware of the realities of food apartheid. Um, some of you may be more familiar with the term food deserts, uh, communities that don't have uh, full supermarkets or access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And some people have critiqued this term food desert because a desert is a naturally occurring reality and um, the segregation around access to food is systemic, structural, planned, and implemented, uh, so it is not naturally occurring. Uh, we also looked at who was more likely to be essential workers, overworked, and underpaid. Uh, we saw big campaigns to call uh, our essential workers heroes, but at the same time, uh, not paying them a livable wage and that affects our physical health and our mental health. So we want to be aware of the impact of trauma, not only as it relates to oppression, uh, but that we also are working with clients who are experiencing the transmission of trauma as it relates to physical abuse and sexual abuse. And so all of the various uh, dynamics that affect our parenting, that affect our mental health and affect our physical health and can be passed down through the generations. I'll just go back one minute to say briefly about this slide. You want to be uh, aware of often the way our research and practice gets focused 
is on the perceptions and the behaviors of clients instead of looking at from an industrial and organizational psychology perspective, from a community psychology perspective, from a law and psychology perspective, what are the things that need to shift? So a lot of our research uses this term perceived racism or perceived discrimination so that the assumption is that the problem is you're perceiving that there is a problem, right? As opposed to the reality of the problem. And often the focus is on uh, ha having people change their behaviors without uh, and changing the behaviors of those who are marginalized and less attention on changing the behaviors and the systems and policies that are uh, creating more distress. So we want to have consciousness raising in our writing, in our research, in our practice, in our plans and implementation. So manifestations of racism and other forms of oppression have shown up in your education. So when you have heard this term, perhaps decolonizing psychology, to decolonize psychology is to contextualize it and to actively engage in both dismantling oppression and promoting liberation. So in terms of a colonized curriculum, I encourage you to think about who you were taught were the greats, the names and scholars that you must know. Um, and as I started being asked more in these past couple of years to present on racial trauma, which is work that you know we've been doing for a long time, uh, often the response would be, it sounds like you all really need a theory. And to that I say, there have already been multiple theories, but those theories you have not been taught in your curriculum, and then therefore you have not taught them to your students. Uh, we also know that it is it shows up, rep, uh, racism and other forms of oppression, show up in representation, uh, who is present, who is at the table, uh, in recruitment and retention. Sometimes people are recruited to come into places but then are excluded and not promoted and so not retained. And I also want to name the realities of tokenism. Sometimes people want marginalized identities in the place so that they can count it on graphs and tables and end of the year reports. So they can put your picture on a brochure or a website, but don't actually want you to shift the ways in which we do things. So we want to move beyond tokenism to actual representation. Along those lines, many of you have heard the term imposter syndrome. And one of the challenges with that framing is it makes it such that the marginalized person has the problem, has the syndrome, versus us recognizing that some people have felt they don't belong because they have been treated as if they don't belong. So we want to be aware of the microaggressions, invalidations, slights, hostility, derogatory attitudes, et cetera. We want to be aware of erasure and denial of presence when uh, someone with a marginalized identity can have a recommendation or a suggestion, it be ignored, and then that same idea presented by a majority person, by someone with more power and privilege, and it being accepted. Uh, it is also problematic having to deal with denial um, and an unwillingness to address the issues. We also are aware um, of an arrogance that some people um, are not in a teachable mindset and a, as we would say in mindfulness to have beginner's mind um, or to have an openness uh, so that we don't shut down when we are corrected or called in. So, you know, when I speak about a community that I am not a part of, um, and even if I speak about a community I am a part of, it is possible, very possible, that I will get something wrong. And what happens when we are corrected is often people will shut down and say, well, never mind, I tried, and it, it uh, wasn't worth it. And so we have to have the emotional capacity to stay present and continue to engage uh, even when we are corrected. So the impact of racial stress and trauma and other forms of oppression can show up as depression, anxiety, anger, 
PTSD, distrust, suicidal thoughts, substance dependence, fatigue, and dissociation. I want you to know that the depression can show up as irritability. And so then we have this stereotype of having a bad attitude, right? But if I am seeing underneath the attitude to the despair, I will respond with a lot more compassion. We also want to be aware of our capacity to sit with people's anger and to think about for yourself whose anger has been more acceptable, more palatable, more excused, and whose anger we have decided is frightening, is scary, uh, requires extreme interventions. And often we see the anger and miss the grief and the despair. We also want to know that uh, the trauma and stress of oppression can show up with somatic complaints, migraines and nausea and backache. There's a lot of backache in our communities. We also can have difficulty concentrating, remembering and focusing. And you want to be mindful of internalized racism and other forms of internalized oppression which is basically when you come to believe the lies you have been told about yourself, right? So when you start to actually believe that members of your community are less attractive, are less smart, are less moral, uh, because those are the messages you have been bombarded with perhaps your whole life. We also face more barriers to resource access, increased risk of physical health difficulties, uh, challenges around relationships and also around spirituality. People can have a loss of faith, a change in faith, or an increase in their faith. And many of our interventions ignore spirituality and religiosity. Uh, we know that the majority of persons who endorse high spirituality and religiosity are women and people of color. So you want to think about who is deserved by the pathologizing of people's faith systems and communities. So it can show up in uh, oppression can show up in a sense of disconnection, uh, doubting yourself and also doubting uh, opportunities and people, a decrease in hope, an increase of just trying to make it through the day. So being in survival mode, worry, feelings of powerlessness, beginning to ask questions about the world, about humanity, uh, increased risk of depression and anxiety, increased risk of trauma, not only the trauma of oppression, but other forms of trauma, as well as increased panic. So we want to be aware that our clients not only hold cultural uh, oppression, but cultural wisdom and cultural resources. And so thinking about what is the legacy of healing for those who came before you? So there's a lot of research now on the vagus nerve. And, you know, we conduct these huge studies that cost a lot of money uh, that to find out in order to calm our nervous system, besides taking breath, two of the very effective interventions are humming and rocking. So those of you who come from communities of color, uh, that will not be uh, strange to you when we think about our taking breath, settling your spirit with humming and rocking. And so our communities and our LGBTQ communities um, are not persons who are just looking to be rescued, who have no knowledge, right? That we have wisdom that has often been appropriated or ignored. So we think about the resource of our rich languages, of our art, of our faith traditions and rituals, of interconnectedness, of strategies that we have learned to survive, such as code switching and psychological masking and the healing remedies uh, that we have developed um, over generations that have often not been passed down or taught or have been uh, taken over. So liberation psychology comes from Latin America and the founder was both a psychologist and a priest. And so at its roots, it is holistic. It recognizes the importance of connection and community as medicine, that cultural identity is medicine. So learning about, the, about who you are 
about your heritage is an intervention, that also our artistry is culturally congruent and it can be a form of medicine. Our spirituality can also be healing and I'll name with spirituality and religiosity that uh, it is just the ways in which it is framed. So for some people, it has been an important resource and source of strength and coping and meaning making. And some people have experienced harm in those spaces. And so it's important to ask the questions to recognize what has that meant for this individual or for this family. So society often asks what's wrong with you. Trauma-informed practitioners say what happened to you. And uh, the psychologists from inclusivepsychologist.com say what happened to you and to your community and what continues to happen. And then from a liberation standpoint, what has happened to you and your community and how can you use not only our interventions, but appropriately integrating those with ancestral wisdom, community wisdom, for not only your survival, but also your thriving. I want to just before I stop to take your questions, name uh, this healing racial trauma model uh, that I developed with Dr. Ocampo. And uh, most of the principles or themes you will recognize, uh, the importance of acknowledging what has happened, getting to a place where people can share their narratives, so shattering silence and shame, rebuilding trust and determining what are signs and indicators that a place or person or community is trustworthy, addressing internalized racism, mourning the losses of what racial trauma and other traumas have taken from you, having a safe space to express your anger as we think about constructive versus destructive anger, coping strategies, healthy versus unhealthy coping strategies. I want to name for you that Western models of trauma recovery usually end there with coping and meaning making. But from a liberation standpoint, a decolonizing standpoint, a social justice standpoint, a feminist psychology standpoint, we have to have also resistant strategies. In other words, it is not sufficient to simply help clients to cope with experiences of invalidation and oppression and marginalization. It is important for our clients to be able to explore what are the different ways I can find voice? What are the different ways that I can advocate for myself? What are the different ways that I can try to protect myself, my children, my community? And there are various aspects of resistance. For some people that will be marching, for some people that will be filling out a complaint card, for some people that will be, I'm no longer gonna shop at that store. For some people, it will mean running for public office. For some people, their resistance uh, will need to also be in their rest and enjoy because the purpose of oppression is to dehumanize and to discourage and to distract. And so when we honor our humanity with our love, with our joy, with our artistry, with our dance, with our voice, those are important steps in our liberation. So I want to name that as we are doing this work, it can be exhausting. There's a term racial battle fatigue, and I would say other forms of oppression, those who are actively working to combat them and to combat intersectional oppression, it can also be exhausting. And so we need sustainability. For us to have sustainability, we have to nourish ourselves and each other, that we don't just advocate for self-care, but for community care, so that we can really shift the tide and count the wins and the progress. And so I hope as you do this work, that you will engage in activities that nourish you, that restore you, that replenish you, that remind you and others of our shared humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, as always, I just feel like you know, taking everything in. Um, and we do have so many uh, questions coming in. And it looks like we've got about 10 minutes to, to do that. So um, yeah, you can see the chat blowing up with all of the thank yous for you. There <laughs> oh, were a lot of fire you. emojis as you were going as usual. <laughs> so um, one question here comes from Kale Woods. 
And they say so much of trauma healing focuses on encoding safety. How can we as oppressed people heal from trauma when the systems we interact with are inherently violent and will continue to harm us? Yes, great question. So some people have uh, advocated for or championed this term ongoing traumatic stress. I like that for us, it's not post. You know, we're not in quote unquote post-racial America, um, that it is an ongoing reality. And so um, one of the things that's important for us and also for us to help our clients with is restorative practices and rituals and also spaces where you don't have to labor, right? So I, I am comfortable and a part of my work is doing like workshop, workshops on racism. And at the same time, that's not what I wanna do all day, every day. <laughs> that's not, you know, I'm not trying to do one-on-one -on -one workshops with people who want to understand racism in America when I'm on my downtime. So us having boundaries and having places where we can play, where we can relax, where we can uh, show up in truth, uh, where we can lay down our armor is going to is so important for us to sustain ourselves. I love that. Yeah, the importance of finding places where you can receive instead yes. of always being the giver, always That's being the right. leader, but that where, yeah, where you can just come and heal. That's so huge. Okay, another question that came in was, how can African Americans use cultural identity as a protective factor? Other people of color have specific cultural traditions to pull from. Many of us are unaware of where we come from. How do we navigate this? Yes, so it is important that we learn it. Some people didn't grow up learn knowing about their culture, their heritage, their language. Uh, sometimes it is because family was trying to protect you. Some people, some generations thought about this idea of quote unquote color blindness or cultural blindness. So if we don't talk about it, we're just gonna see that we're all the same. And so it's just like with psychoeducation, right? In, in psychoeducation, if I think mindfulness is helpful to someone, if they've never learned about mindfulness, I don't take it off the list of interventions because they're not familiar, right? But some of us, if the client never learned about their culture, then we say, never mind, as opposed to what would it be like if someone is uh, surviving in on a predominantly white campus to learn from people who came before them, whether in books or actual people or mentors or you know older students. And so uh, it is, the, the culture is there uh, online, in books, and in living people. And I would say, even if you weren't raised with it, it's not too late to learn it. And I appreciate I someone gave a, a shout out for, for my book, which is called Homecoming. And there's also the Homecoming podcast. For sure. Yeah. And it's reminding me of um, like Chapman Hilliard's work too on Black history knowledge as, as that being an important intervention. And so yeah, that, that we as counselors can bring that in to the work that we do and share that um, if folks are feeling disconnected from that history. Because I think that's what you also said, part of oppression is to dehumanize, discourage, and distract. And part of that is keeping people off, like keeping that's people right. out of knowing their history. So thank yes. you for that. Yeah. Okay, the next part, there's three questions that are sort of the same, which is people okay. have gotten a taste of liberation psychology and the amazing work that you do around this. Um, and they're wanting, so is there a program that teaches more about this? What other trainings do you have coming up? Do you have a webinar for your healing model? Like I'll, where, where do people go to get more of this? Yes, I love it. So there is a uh, liberation psychology uh, textbook, which was published by APA. And um, you can get that book. I have um, a book that was co-edited with uh, Dr. Lillian Comos Diaz on womanist and muharista psychologies, the psychology of black women and Latinx uh, women and femmes. And so um, those are two books that I would recommend. Um, you can go to my website, which I probably need to update, um, but it will have uh, some of my presentations or where you can find uh, webinars that either I have done in the past or that I will do uh, in the future. Um, the Division of Counseling Psychology for APA, I think, has placed on YouTube a webinar that we did uh, on liberation psychology. And um, so those are some of the recommendations. But definitely look at um, the work of Dr. Lillian Comos Diaz uh, and, and others will come up in the references. For sure. Yeah. And since I was part of your dream team, the Tama for APA YouTube channel is still up. And Dr. Bryant did like 
a webinar a week, it felt like about this during <laughs> that time as you were campaigning. And so that's another place where your webinars are that are all fantastic with that. Um, okay, so another question came in. We, I think we got time for one, maybe two more. Um, so started out, thank you, phenomenal lecture. Um, how do we integrate these truths slash this work in the reality of community mental health slash huge caseload slash Medi-Cal billing slash productivity requirements the way the work shows up? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say it is important in, in uh, this aspect to be bilingual. And what I mean by that is I know we have to write and frame some things in the ways that insurance panels will comprehend, but I can do that and still do this work, right? So if we're looking at um, progressive muscle relaxation and in that progressive muscle relaxation, I also integrate. So what I'll put in front of all of those different terms they like is culturally informed or culturally emergent mindfulness. So one approach you can look up as it relates to mindfulness is soulfulness, which was created by Dr. Shelley Harrell. Um, and then integrating the expressive arts. Um, you can definitely do that when we look at uh, trauma work that the arts you know, are a, a helpful intervention. So it, it is very much possible. And I, I encourage you to do it, to experiment. I love that the idea of calling it bilingual, right? Like that we can put in the case notes, psychoeducation. They don't right. even know the psychoeducation was a bell hooks book. Right? Like, right. So, right. um, yeah. so yeah, really, really, yes. really beautiful. Um, okay, so I have one last question I think we have. As a supervisor of an employee who exhibits many of the trust issues and difficulty discerning ally from adversary, how would you help them feel safe and less reactive with their team? Yeah, I would say um, what I call sacred pause. And so when I am reactive or quick to respond, I'm going off of um, instinct. It's not always intuition. Sometimes I'm triggered. And so I can give myself a beat, right? To just make a commitment when something is off or something is set off. It's not that I'm going to silence myself. I'm just gonna give myself a pause so that I can reflect on you know, what was actually said. Um, what did that remind me of? Uh, is there a pattern as it relates to this place or this person? How would I like to respond so that I don't feel out of control? I feel I made a choice. So even if I'm going to come with the fire, it is a choice. <laughs> so uh, to just give yourself a pause uh, and to think within yourself, this is the last thing I'll just say on that is, are you looking for a release for yourself or are you looking for something to shift in the space, right? Because if I'm trying to change an organization, then I am going to move strategically. If this isn't about strategy, but I just want you all to know how I feel and that this was upsetting and I don't want to strategize that, I just want you to feel what I feel, then that is also a choice and it's an acceptable choice, but just know, uh, know what your intention is what your desire is, and then that can guide which direction you go in. Am I trying to like move this train somewhere or am I just needing you all to hear my humanity that this was very hurtful? And sometimes it's both, but that requires <laughs> another strategy. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, sometimes it's both. Well, I just want to thank you again so much for coming, spending this hour with us, um, sort of wrapping up our 10 webinar series. Um, we can't think of a better way to do that. And I am so excited that you're going to be leading the APA and bringing more of this to the mainstream. I was so struck by somebody having the gall to say to you, this sounds like it needs a theory. <laughs> when, like, I mean, your theory is not new. It's almost 20 years old that that yes. theory has been so clearly out there in the literature. Yeah. So um, yeah, just really, really grateful for you and all the work that you're doing and that you came and shared this time with us. Um, if there, is there any last thoughts you want to leave us with or anything that you would like to, to end with us? Yes, I invite you this compassion hold if it aligns with you hand on your heart, hand on your belly, inhale in through the nose, you are worthy of care, exhale out through the mouth, and think about one thing you stand in need of, more joy, more love, more peace, whatever that thing you stand in need of, if you can rub your hands together, even if your camera is off, <laughs>
and know there are other people, other 260 people who need that as well. And so we wanna send whatever we are receiving out to the other providers who are here. Much appreciation to all of you. So much appreciation. You have a wonderful rest of your day. Everyone, the sign out links, if you were looking for CEUs or the HRSA stipend are in the chat. Um, I will stay here for just a moment to let you all click those links. Otherwise we will end for today. Thank you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, everyone. Thank you. And I see all your beautiful messages. Thank you so much. Oh, I love that. I was changed in this one hour. It's beautiful. <laughs>